Hi, everyone. We want to welcome you to our uh, Authors Fest. Uh, I'm Marcos, and uh, thank you for joining the KV Philan Public Library for Authors Fest 2021. Uh, this year, our theme is visual storytelling. And so with us is our very special guest. He's an award-winning author, having received the Hal Clement Young Adult Award for Science Fiction. He has short stories uh, that are, have been published in several magazines and anthologies. He is perhaps best known, though, as the author of the Jumper series. His original book was turned into the 2008 feature film by the same name, starring uh, Hayden Christensen and uh, Samuel L. Jackson. And his third book was uh, the basis for the YouTube Red series, Impulse. Uh, today, he's going to be uh, speaking to us about um, why your favorite book is so different from its movie, which is fitting because he's uh, had all this experience. So uh, just a quick reminder that if you do have any questions for our presenter, please leave them in the comment section. And uh, this will be interactive. So uh, if he asks you a question, please feel free to respond as well. So without further ado, please allow me to introduce our very special guest, Stephen Gould. Thank you very much, um, Marcos. I really appreciate you and the library reaching out to me to allow me to participate in this today. Um, as Marcos said, um, I was going to talk a bit about why your favorite book, movie, or TV series isn't like the book at all, or at least the, the semblance isn't there in ways that you would like it to be. Um, and there's a one sentence answer, um, which doesn't really tell you why as much, but the one sentence answer is because your favorite book has too much stuff. Okay. The events that happen even in a short novel, if, if included, if all the events in that story are included in its adaptation, it could easily fill up a long season of a television show or more. Um, an example of this pretty clearly is Game of Thrones by uh, George R. R. Martin, um, who passed up several um, uh, offers to make it into a feature film and instead went with the HBO uh, series instead, because there's just too much stuff, too many events, too many characters, too many uh, settings, um, too many subplots happening in that for it to go to a movie. But even so, there is so much of those books that is not making it into that long series. So, so when creators, um, writers, producers, directors set out to adapt a novel and and it's a novel that they actually love or at least like. Uh, the first thing they try to do is identify what is the one thing about that story, that novel um, that they love the most that that gets them the most excited. And this is, what they try and build their movie or series around. Sometimes they include too much from the book and they end up with a confused mess. And sometimes they don't include enough from the novel and the result is rather tasteless, kind of like trimming way too much of the fat off the steak you're grilling, okay? So then there are those who are adapting the work who actually don't have that that love or any particular feeling for the book, but have been hired to adapt or direct, you know, to write, direct, produce uh, because of work they've done on other television series. But uh, so um, the result, it always surprises me when I see a book adapted and the resulting movie could easily have been made without licensing the original work at all. And this is the sort of thing that happens when people don't have the create people who are adapting it 
don't have any investment in the original work. Um, one of the television networks that was considering The Walking Dead um, actually said to you know company that was uh, trying to pitch that we love this this is wonderful we just have one issue does it have to have zombies in it so they passed on the series because of course how could it do well with all those pesky zombies in it and and we all know how badly that television series failed so i'm going to talk specifically about ways in which books have too much stuff um, and one of those things uh, is setting uh, let me describe i'm going to describe a place and this place is how is being described in the way a story or a novel um, prose novel prose story would describe a setting the motel room had a through wall air conditioner unit that rattled every time the compressor came on. Sorry, let me do that again. The motel room had a through the wall air conditioner unit that rattled every time the compressor came on. And on the wall below it, leaking condensate had created a stain in the shape of Italy. That's it. That's the entire description of this hotel room. Um, what I'd like you guys to do, if you if you've got access to the chat, um, is tell me what other things you can tell me about that hotel room that I just described to you. Uh, I might try a few questions. Um, for instance, um, what level of hotel room is this? What can you tell me about the beds? You know, how good are the towels? You know, are you more or less likely to hear things happening in the next room? Um, Well, I'm not seeing any questions yet. So what I'm going to do is, um, you know, give you my impressions of that. And that is, we're talking about a pretty cheap hotel room or motel room. Um, these are probably pretty darn thin towels. Um, the bed probably makes a little bit of noise when you sit on it. Um, the the carpet is probably pretty questionable. It's either thin, very thin, very uncushioned. It might even date back. It could be sort of shaggy, but it's not something you'd feel comfortable lying down on in this hotel room. Um, essentially, we're talking about a relatively inexpensive hotel room. But the important thing about this example is as a novelist, I can describe a hotel room like that, and my readers will promptly fill in the entire um, room, the entire um, the nature of that hotel it's in, uh, what sort of activities are happening out in the parking lot of this hotel, what's happening there with um, the um, you know, again, how noisy is this hotel? Um, are there people coming in for a couple of hours at this hotel and then leaving? Um, so now this is something that happens. This is the interactive nature of prose fiction. I actually find in many ways prose fiction to be more engaging in some ways than visual storytelling, simply because of this participation by the reader, by the audience. Um, but 
if we're going to adapt the novel or story or whatever um, this particular room is in, I probably, I as the writer spent five minutes invoking this room through the aid of my readers. And that was my investment in it. I did not, that's all I had to invest to get this setting going. Uh, if this becomes a TV series, there's many questions that have to be asked. Again, there are lots of scenes in this, in this book. Uh, and the writer, because he does not have to invest um, this huge amount of time um, creating these spaces, he just has to tell you what this space is kind of like. And the reader will end up you know, filling out, flushing out the rest of the details. If this is going up on a television screen or on a movie screen, we have to have a physical location. A set designer has to know what color that awful carpet is. They have to know, the sound designer has to know what kind of sounds that bed makes when someone sits down on it or does other activities on it. Um, the, the lighting uh, director needs to know what sort of lighting is there. Is this fluorescent lighting that kind of flickers a little bit? Is this a little step up from that? So it's more solid, is it more yellowy? Is it, you know, the kind of uh, fluorescent white that causes skin tones to be not very attractive? Um, so there's all these decisions that need to be made if they even use that setting. So that's the first thing they have to decide. Um, how important is the setting to this, the overall story? Um, it might be not very important at all, in which case they'll go, okay, uh, that's just not going in the movie, period. Or the other situation might be that there is something important about the scene in that room, but the location has no particular bearing on the, on the information conveyed. So we will move that scene to another setting that we have to use anyway. So that information may get moved again that's that room goes out or this may be really important um but just once one time so um what's the quickest way we can do this scene if it's a television series or a, like a television pilot um the information conveyed in that scene is important it's kind of important that it be that kind of sleazy hotel where that information is conveyed or the actions that happens happens in that sort of setting. In that case, they're probably going to go out for a location scout to find a location that matches that scene, but that they don't have to build. They don't have to create that entire scene. They don't have to transform an existing room into that room. Um, they just need to find something that's like that and decide whether they can use the furniture that they find in that setting once they find it or if they have to change out some of the furniture they have to do things with the lighting and so on but once they're done boom we walk out we don't have to worry about that scene again unless if it's a pilot oops the pilot got picked up and it turns out that that room is in very important to the um to the rest of the uh, series and it has become a recurring location in which case now they have to probably even if they went out on location um, and got a scene once they've decided the scene is going to happen over and over again they're probably not going to go out and rent that same location over and over again disrupting the hotel's business and doing all the transfer of activities and stuff to that location that they have to do 
to do a scene there. Instead, they are going to recreate the interior of that room on a soundstage where they have other sets that they are using. And they will just use that um, for those scenes that they need to. But in that case, they can't just say those lines I said. They have to know the color of the wall, the kind of wall covering, the types of um, you know the types of carpet, the the bedding, the colors of the bedding. You know, again, all those. What are the, what is the television like that's in there? Um, could this be a period piece? In which case, they had to bring in an old cathode ray tube anyway, um, rather than the flat screens we all see in hotels now, um, and so on. So, this is the sort of thing that makes adaptations to start to change. Um, now, the same thing that I just talked about, is this an important setting? All of these happen, um, all these decisions happen with characters as well. Um, again, a writer can say, the hotel clerk you know, told him about the Plymouth that was waiting in the parking lot every night from three o'clock in the morning to five o'clock. And the throaty roar of its engine every time it pulled away, but it was always there every night. Now again, this is the hotel clerk who, that, I, that was my investment. I just made that up on the spot. I didn't even write that down in my notes. That is a character I created. I could add a few details. The hotel room clerk with the prominent Adam's apple and the bald spot. Um, the, the hotel clerk who spent most of his time knitting, you know, or who watching anime on a little TV right behind the counter, whatever. So again, little details, but that's my total investment in creating that character. Um, however, you know, is this an important character? Even if that information was important, can we convey that information with a different character, uh, with a character that we have to use over and over again anyway? So it's possible that then we don't have to hire another one of those pesky actors who want to be fed and stuff. Um, or if it's important that that particular character say that information, that's the one time, well, we may have to, um, you may actually have to hire um, a one-time actor who's going to come in and say that and go away. Um, but they're going to try and avoid that when they can, um, unless they've got a really big budget. And at this point, um, maybe the producer's nephew is going to come in and say that line. Um, but let's say this is an ongoing and critical character. Uh, you're going to have to hire one of those pesky actors and you have to pay SAG, right, you know, SAG rates, Screen Actor Guild rates. And, um, and God forbid, you really want to do a decent background check because nowadays um, there's always a danger you're going to find out he is a sexual harasser, serial sexual harasser. And when that comes out, you're going to have to kill off that character or replace him with another actor or character later. So, you know, hiring these people is uh, has consequences. So um, there are, so again, how many actors, how many characters out of the book are going to make it into this, into this uh, video? Then we have the ways in which stories are told. Um, so my jumper series, um, as an example, has a lot, is a first person, my first book, first book is a first person um, 
story viewpoint meaning um it's like a it's like various diary could be diary entries it's like a journal it's like someone telling you what their experience was including what they were thinking how they were feeling what emotional um responses they had to um the events of the story uh, to their own actions and to other actions so that's something that um is less done in um video and movies it's not never done um in the cases of something like um ferris bueller's day off for instance um what you get is a bunch of almost Shakespearean soliloquies where Ferris Bueller breaks the fourth wall and turns to the audience and and monologues, right? Not quite supervillain monologuing, but he talks about, you know, how he feels about something or what he thinks about other characters' actions and and their situation. So um So there are, so the four types of viewpoint, of course, are, you know, there are actually more than this, but these are the four basic. There's first person point of view, the one I just talked about. There's second person point of view, where the story is told to you. So it's not told to you, it's told about you. Um, you wake up in a, sleazy hotel room and you know find a body on the floor whatever but every action is about what you do what you are seeing what you are doing what you are hearing what you are feeling um what you are experiencing um this is the sort of story um that is often told in video games where you as a character are actually seeing stuff where you see your hands sticking out in front of you. Um, you know, we see your arms, but it's like the camera was set right here. Uh, and you're just going around seeing what you would see and doing stuff. So that's a second person story. There have been a few movies like that. There's one uh, with Humphrey Bogart, where he actually has been, he is a convicted murderer who did not um actually do the crime i believe but the main point is the first you know 15 minutes of that story is told in exactly that method um where he is um breaking out of prison escaping and finding a plastic surgeon to change his face and the whole movie actually switches to what we're more used to the next point third person point of view when after he takes he goes to a mirror and takes off the bandages from his uh, plastic surgery operation and is Humphrey Bogart at which point boom we switch to a third person point of view where we're watching Humphrey Bogart go around and do the things he does in the uh, in the movie um so there's definitely stuff so third person point of view limited is what we are used to seeing it's the most popular version of commercial fiction prose fiction as well and that is where we are seeing characters do say react to things in settings that we are seeing, we are being told as we are essentially the audience, but we are an audience that is seeing them from outside their person. We are not seeing what they are thinking or what they're feeling. We are getting clues to how they feel and what they are thinking by their actions, um, by acting. Um, so really good actors are are quite good at conveying this information, but they are not, um, they're not hearing, 
you know, the things they think. Again, this stuff is occasionally, does occasionally make it into video and occasionally make it into movies, uh, often in campy ways, but sometimes it comes in uh, sincerely um, with people's reactions. You hear their, the actor's voice, their mouth may be shut, but they hear their, the voice happens often with a little bit of reverb to make it sound like it's echoing through their, their head um, rather than out there. They're not saying it to anybody. They're just sort of, oh my God, etc. cetera. So, um, and this is what we're more used to seeing. So if a story, the prose story, the prose novel is using more of that first person point of view or, um, or another example is third person point of view omniscient where you're still seeing stuff from outside the characters but you are given uh, exact not exact but you know you're given access to their thoughts and feelings without having to infer them from their actions or their facial reactions or whatever they're and something like that um I mean, you'll that again is a is a not that common form of commercial fiction. It used to be much more call, common in the nineteenth century, um, but um, maybe the early twentieth century there were novels that did that, and there are still novels that do that. But again, that is very hard to um, convey. Um, another case is a third person point of view limited where the narrator themselves is conveying huge amounts of opinion, uh, huge amounts of information in ways that um, really make them more of a character than, than the person who's telling these other people's stories. So, they talk so much. A good example of this in movies or video, uh, since it's been done both ways as well as in radio, is Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where the narrator is telling all these amusing little stories all the way through that convey needed information for what's going on in the overall plot. Um, so it can another so that's getting close to that third person point of view omniscient uh, but mostly they Douglas Adams was staying away from the third person of the interior thoughts of people um, as much as more than the um, um, and just making that the narrator a very important uh, aspect of the book and there are times when like that and when in first person point of view where the interior comments thoughts and feelings of the character are such an important element of what the book is a current example very good example of this is a series called The Murderbot Diaries by Martha Wells right now, where you are talking about a part machine, part organic life form, um, who is, you know, which was a, what's called a sec bot, a security robot, but they call them constructs because they have this organic nature and the machine nature. Um, but they give them these things called governor, uh, modules which which absolutely make them slaves because they will punish them um, with shocks to the nervous system and so on um, when they do not do exactly what they're supposed to do um, so this main character has actually disabled his and talked about how he wants to go on this horrible killing rage of killing all the humans but then instead discovered all the media feeds that he could get access to and instead spent the next 38,000 hours um, 
watching lots of, respectively, watching TV, reading books, listening to music, and so on. Um, but the point is, his character, the nature of his character, the his perspective on things, which actually resembles um, human autism in a certain way, um, is such a charming part of 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 what this story is that um, um, it would take. I would love to see this adapted, but it is it is that is such an important aspect of this character, this author's, you know, this uh, the narration in this story that um, it would have to be adapted by someone masterful to, to get that same charm and um, an enjoyment. So again. That's a book that I would not expect to see exactly like, you know, if they adapted it, I would not expect to see it as well done as, um, or done in the same way. Let me put it that way. Um, there is a, um, I, I tend to evaluate adaptations um of books uh, more like i would uh, evaluate original movies original tv series and that is regardless of what the nature of the original work was how successful were they in telling what has become their own story. And by their, I mean the producers, the directors, the, 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 um, the um, writers. Um, they're telling what has become their story in the adaptation because, again, they're trying to take what most excites them about the original work and then building something around it that does work for television and and media. So even if they've changed most of the, um, you know, the content of the book, I want to ask this question, how well did they tell their story? Not how well did they tell the original books? Um, how well did they make that leap onto the screen? But how well did they create a story that in its own context, even if someone has never read the original books, how successful a movie is this? And sometimes the answer is they've done quite well, but that fans of the original work are going to be horribly disappointed because the experience is not the same. And sometimes, um, you know, Sometimes they are, um, but that's a different question than how good is the work in of itself. An adaptation kind of has to be evaluated on its own terms. Let me see, how are we doing? Oh, that's good. Um, um, if there are any questions, um, I'd, I'd love to uh, go ahead and take them now. Okay, um, we do have some questions that we uh, have that uh, we're pre pre prepared for you. Okay. So um, here's the first one. How involved were you in making the jumper film? Like uh, as far as decisions go? I had very little uh, involvement at all. Um, I my one involvement was that I was writing uh, the, a, a tie-in book for the movie that took the backstory of the Jamie Bell character, uh, Griffin, and wrote his backstory that essentially takes you up to some time before 
the jumper movie. That book is is true to the jumper, I mean, movie uh, universe, their setting. It fits in their setting, um, but it does not fit in, um, it is not congruent with my um, other four books that I've written in the jumper series, uh, Jumper, Reflex, Impulse, and Exo, um, and the upcoming Vector. But the, um, but the only, so I didn't have any input other than my original works, uh, but I was getting glimpses into their production design and the thoughts about where the story was, their story was going, um, because they needed to give me that information to help write that tie-in novel. So I was writing stuff, which had some interesting you know, consequences. Uh, for instance, Jamie Bell is from Northern England. He has a particular accent, uh, but when they started that, when they wrote that uh, screenplay, the final screenplay for that, uh, he was an American, he was gonna be an American. Um, and he was doing an American accent in the first couple of days of their shooting when Doug Lyman says, hmm, let's try this in your normal accent. Let's try this, you know, without the American accent. And suddenly I've written a third to a half a novel of this American character. And I get told, oh, well, they decided now he's British. So um, you have to change that. <laughs> but, so I was getting uh, changes. I was getting affected by what they were doing, but I was not giving input into what they did. Fortunately, it wasn't that hard to do um, because um, he was, um, I just had, he was in San Diego. I just had to make them being um, expats, ex expatriates in America who were British but they had perfectly good reasons for being there since, you know, he had already been pursued to a certain extent um, out of England. So it, it worked out fine. <laughs> uh, kind of a follow-up to that. Uh, what was the most difficult part about turning Jumper into a film? Um, <laughs> I don't have, I didn't have any, it wasn't hard at all. <laughs> I didn't have to, I didn't have to do it. But uh, there's an interesting story about the normal relationship. This is not a story, it's an example, um, a parable almost of, um, of how the literary world or the, you know, and the, um, and Hollywood, essentially it's about New York is the literary world and and Hollywood is the California movie world interact. And so the process of writing a book, uh, selling a book to Hollywood is this case where this, this agent is driving through the desert somewhere near Las Vegas. And he comes up to this giant fence and this other car is approaching from the other side. And um, the car pulls up, it's around midnight and the agent from coming from the east takes a manuscript and he heaves it up over the fence. Sorry, um, that's not going to work. Excuse me a second. I just knocked down. Well, let's see how bad this is. Yeah. So essentially, I have something that shades my skylight, so I don't um, have too much glare. But now I'm going to have glare, but. We'll That's okay. We'll work around it. Um, the uh, but anyway, and on the other side, a the guy from Hollywood heaves his suitcase full of cash over the fence in the other direction, and then they both get back in their cars and they drive away. And that's the extent of the normal interaction between Hollywood and the literary world, or the <laughs> or essentially the author and Hollywood, in how they um, how they work together. Now there have been many, many exceptions to that in you know in the world. There have been authors who've actually been hired to write the screenplays, or uh, you know, Raymond Chandler famously had a lot to do with uh, some of his adaptations, earlier adaptations. Um, 
although it's possible that some of his um, his uh, subsequent alcoholism was related to being too close to all of that uh, stuff. Um, but, um, and then there's people who were so successful, you know, their literary works uh, have risen to the bestseller uh, level that they um, have the pull to have sufficient, significant uh, input in the um, into the process. Uh, obvious examples are people like Stephen King. Um, uh, sorry, Crichton. I'm trying to remember Crichton's first name. Uh, you know, like um, the Andromeda Strain, um, Jurassic Park, and all that. Oh, yeah. Um, Michael, Michael, Crichton. Crichton, Michael Crichton, sorry, uh, you know, he actually ended up being more of a Hollywood person than a literary person, in the, you know, around halfway through most of his books. Um, and obviously, probably the biggest elephant in the room right now is uh, J.K. Rowling, who not only, you know, was a, was, you know, a producer, of the of the books had definite um, abilities to naysay decisions made, and then later on, you know, for these new movies, has been uh, actually writing screenplay the screenplays for them as well as being a producer for the uh, Fantastic Beasts and so on. Uh, but this is not at all typical. It is far more typical for a writer to, you know, have the um, have that experience, excuse me, for them to purchase or first option and then purchase uh, the rights to a, a book. And then um, and the writer takes the money and then just, they quite often get invited to the premiere, but they don't. Um, maybe they'll have a chance to come on set. Uh, as long as they're relatively cool about it. There is uh, an infamous writer, fairly, fairly successful writer who had a uh, movie made by, well, I don't want actually, who had a big movie made, a uh, very successful, I mean, you know, big budget, big director, big actors um, made and went on the set, um, and within an hour and a half was escorted off the set by security and told never to come back. <laughs> oh, no. Because they're, you know, they weren't able to separate their feelings for their work from what's happening with the, um, with, you know, as far as what the movie company was doing with their, their work. And, um, it's sort of like, um, so the person who wrote, is it Michael Caine? Not Caine, not, it's Sia. It's the guy who wrote, uh, not Michael. It's the guy who wrote, um, The Postman Always Rings Twice and Double Indemnity, um, who was quite a successful writer in that even during his lifetime, um, there were, multiple adaptations of his work in Hollywood. And, um, and even after his death, there have been adaptations of his work. Um, but he was asked by a, a Hollywood re a reporter, not a Hollywood reporter, a reporter says, um, but Mr. Kane, isn't it horrible what Hollywood has done to your novels? And he said, and this is a thing I've always come back to when I think about my relation to any sort of adaptation done by my work. He said, Hollywood hasn't done a damn thing to my novels. They're right there on the shelf, just like they always have been and always will be. So that's right. <laughs> so they, the point is, and I think that's where I come to that viewpoint of this work 
this adaptation is not my work, it is their work. Yes, they're using my work as sort of sort of source material, but they are making something that is substantially different. And um, and if they and frankly, if they tried to be too slavishly accurate, you know, for what they're trying in trying to adapt exactly the same thing, there's a really, really good chance that they would um, kind of mess up. Uh, it would actually be bad. Um, for me, my least favorite, for instance, of the Harry Potter, the original Harry Potter movie adaptations is the first one, which is the most slavishly adapting, uh, you know, inclusive of these events and, and scenes um, that were in, you know, the book as well. I think they actually they all improved after that one way or another uh, and were not as and while they were all pretty you know you could definitely map events and significant events and things through the um, thing they certainly also did took more made more changes made more or pared down things more uh, than the that first one. Right. So we have a couple more questions here. Sure. Uh, one of the questions is, uh, do you feel that the, the Jumper film was pretty close to the book? And was, was there a really obvious change that you can remember? Uh, besides the character, of course, because you, you did talk about that. Um, so I do not feel that it's a, I think the first 15 minutes are, are close. To the spirit and the and the events in the movie, but then they were working on their their story. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, I've said this before in public. I feel that they didn't do the. And actually, the director Doug Lyman actually agrees with me on this. Um, though he's may have he said it other ways, uh, but I don't think they did the best job of telling their story. Uh, in the Jumper movie. Um, among other things, I mean, you could sit, they could have improved it immeasurably, actually, just by including the scenes that they cut out, but yet included in the DVD, you know, deleted scenes section of the... Oh, yeah. Uh, because they're all scenes that are about character development. Mm -hmm. and and um, that movie was cut down to, um, I don't know, it was something ridiculous. It, it, it's like 89 minutes. It's not. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I must admit, I, I would love to see a mini series uh, adaptation of, of Jumper, the first mm -hmm. book, where, you know, it was somewhat more inclusive of the events and, and the actual direction, the my book went versus where their movie went. But the things I would want that, that I found, that I've heard people complain about um, or that they hungered for in an adaptation had far more to do with uh, character with depicting the character, the journey the character went through, which is not that all the same character they, you know, they uh -huh. created in um, thing. Uh, Lyman was very excited about the idea of a superhero who did not act like a superhero, right? So effectively being able to teleport is a pretty, you know, powerful uh, power, but yeah. he wanted he, he was putting in scenes like, um, I mean, there's the first time you actually see uh, Hayden Christensen as the older Davy. He is um, watching people trapped on this on this wreckage that is being swept downstream in a flood, and the 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 person who's 
who's you know reporting on this time i don't know how they'll be helped i mean nobody can reach them blah, blah, blah. and the implication right there and and essentially uh the davy character that we have there just changes the channel right he doesn't mm -hmm. and almost yawns i think he's eating as well he just no reaction whatsoever um when he could have um yeah he could have easily done something about that well maybe not maybe he didn't have a jump site but <laughs> so he wanted to make that character he deliberately made a choice to make the character like that and that's that's actually a fairly significant change from the character as he's depicted in the book who actually gets involved in the neighbor whose husband is beating her and the you know there's lots of stuff that where he does end up intervening when he can uh, oh. and stuff that uh, you know is significant okay um next question uh what is the best movie adaption that you have seen or are aware of so in your opinion wow uh, there's a couple i was very impressed with holes holes oh, okay. um i actually didn't read the book until after i'd seen the movie and I was astonished at how well they had done what was going on in the book in that movie. Mm -hmm. um, it was both faithful and it worked in, in this amazing way. Another one that's really impressive is um, Fight Club, okay? Uh -huh. as, an, as a movie adaptation, they did an astonishing job on that too. Those are, those are two pretty good examples. I can agree with that. <laughs> Definitely. All right, um, last cut, last thing here. Um, so you mentioned uh, you have a book coming out soon, Vector. Do you know uh, when that'll be released? It's not done, so oh, okay. I have to turn it in before they can schedule it. So. Um, <laughs> But I can talk a little bit about, you know, it definitely takes place after EXO. It does take place during and slightly after a global pandemic. Oh, wow. And so I don't know if the readers will be able to identify with that or be able to, you know, picture what that's like, uh, but maybe they will. Um, but that vector, you know, among other things, involves the sense of biological vectors, as well as the sense of vectors in physics. So, um, I, so I think uh, it'll be interesting. Well, that's great. You have to let me know uh, when you do uh, get it released, uh, so we can look for the copy because we would definitely love to have that. Sure, sure. All right, uh, I don't think we have any other questions. So um, any final words before we uh, bid farewell? Uh, thanks to the library for having me out, um, having me virtually out. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, I look, yeah, definitely. For those of you who haven't had your second shot yet, Go get your second shot. For those of you who haven't had your first shot, go get your shots. Get vaccinated, please. Okay. That's good. <laughs> well, I uh, want to say thank you to our special guest, Stephen Gold, uh, for sharing on uh, why is your favorite book so different from the movie. Uh, the Octavia Flynn Public Library here in Gallup invites you to join us for live and recorded presentations daily during the month of May. You can uh, find the schedule of events on our website at OFPL.online. And uh, please make sure to follow us on Facebook, like and subscribe to OFPL's YouTube channel so you can stay up to date on all of our events and programming. And uh, 
again, uh, on behalf of Octavia Fallon Public Library, uh, we want to just thank you for watching and have a good night.